Hi, so we're here with Rachel Bernstein today. She is a licensed marriage and family counselor and a uh, cult specialist. And we had her on the Sensibly Speaking podcast last week, and I was I learned a lot during that podcast from her. Um, she's gotten over a thousand people, uh, helped them out of destructive cult situations in the 25 years that she's been doing uh, family counseling and individual counseling. And uh, she's definitely what I would consider an expert in this field. And the, the point of these video interviews that we're doing today is not necessarily to rehash everything we covered in the podcast. So I do have a link to the podcast below in the description for this video, and you can uh, check that out. But we are going to cover some of the some of what we talked about in the podcast, just so anybody who hasn't heard that will be familiar with who um, can find out here who Rachel is and what what this is all about. So, hi Rachel, welcome to uh, my channel. Thank you for doing this. Hi, it's very nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Um, so first, I think um, I would like to find out what is it that basically motivated you to get into this field in the first place. You've been doing this for you know a couple decades now, and um, clearly you're motivated to help people, but how did this whole thing get going? It's a very good question because I have never been in a cult myself, so people ask me that a lot. Um, I am someone who was raised in a family that um, was really run by activists, people who wanted to make a difference, people who wanted to reach out to others, people who also wanted to help when help was needed. Uh, and along the way, when I was uh, younger um, and still living at home, um, my older sibling had a very good friend who got involved in Scientology. And we didn't know what this was and that this could exist. Uh, and it seemed to really motivate my father, especially, to want to help out. And he hated the fact that there could be something out there that could tear families apart and there was nothing that parents could do about it. Um, and so it became dinner table conversation, which is. Uh, I, I knew growing up that I was having very different conversations at the dinner table than my friends were having. Um, and oh, so it was always, <laughs> yes, always. And uh, so it was always an interest. And then it continued to be through a sequence of events um, in college and afterwards. Okay. And now what were you, uh, so you were in college or going into college uh, shortly after this whole experience with your sister. Um, and what did you study in college? What are your what are your degrees in and whatnot? Right. So I have teaching credentials in general and in special ed. I was planning to be a special ed teacher, and I am one. I do it only part time, uh, and have run uh, support groups for the siblings of people with special needs. Have a pool party at my house every summer for an uh, adults with special needs group who said that they haven't throughout their life been invited to pool parties like other kids. Um, so it's something that's always uh, been of interest. But while I was in undergrad, before I was in in overgrad, um, um, studying to become a therapist, um, I saw cults on my campus. And I thought, wow, this really does exist. Uh, and I was in a state other than the one I was raised in. I could see the same names of groups and front groups and people getting sucked in and and not knowing what they were getting sucked into. It was really fascinating and um, alarming. Scientology is not the only destructive cult on the block. I, I'm curious what other groups have you, you know, ended up assisting people with or helping people to recover from? Right, so when I uh, went on to become a therapist, uh, I noticed people in my program that I was studying with who would um, talk about how they could see referring a client to a group like EST because it could be so helpful. And and I thought, hmm, uh, that's going to be interesting that here someone could go to a therapist for help and the therapist could refer them to a group that for some people is really destructive. Um, so it kind of made me dig my heels in a little more to think that if I'm going to become a therapist, I really want to be able to do this uh, as part of my practice. I didn't realize it was going to become about 70 to 80% of my practice, but it has consistently been. 
And so, yeah, no, Scientology is not the only group around. It was, it was the group that was first in my face and intimidating me and doing what it could to try to stop me, uh, which I found out at the time was par for the course. Um, but I got introduced to the fact that cults come in all flavors. Uh, and so I was getting calls from people who were not only in Scientology or whose loved ones were in Scientology, but I was getting calls from people who were um, born and raised in the Children of God, uh, now the, the family, and in, um, had gotten caught up with psychics um, who were um, in groups that they thought were churches, groups that they thought were temples, um, and some where they lived at home, some where they lived on compounds, and I realized it, it comes in so many different ways, and it drove me to try to figure out what the common denominators were, um, and that was fascinating for me. Right. That, and it has been fascinating for me, too, just in researching and finding out about these things, how there, the, there are common traits to these groups that we label as destructive cults, you know, because not all religions, I don't, I don't subscribe to the viewpoint that all religions are cults no. or are destructive cults, you know, yeah. and, uh, and I don't think that, that they're all 100% harmful and it's all black and white. Um, but there are certainly no shortage of these groups out there that you could label as destructive cults, and there are characteristics of them. Mm -hmm. what, um, what would you say, you know, we don't have to go into a full review of everything, but what would you say are some of the characteristics or the, the things that, symptoms that, that make you go, oh, yeah, something destructive cult here. What, 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 what gives, what's your educated view on that now? Okay, so now um, I know to look for these things that I'll be describing, not only in larger organizations, but even in one-on-one -on -one kinds of controlling relationships, um, because it doesn't matter the size of the group either to make it a cult or not. Uh, you can have two people. That's enough for a cult. Um, what I noticed was that you had to have somebody who was really in charge. There was a power differential. Someone had all the answers, someone was in charge, and the other person was a follower, or the group were followers, and that they needed to follow in an unquestioning way, having unquestioning devotion to the leader, to the teachings. Uh, and even if the teachings changed, and suddenly so whatever was okay on Monday was no longer okay on Tuesday, you had to be fine with that and just keep going along with it. Um, the other part is the deception that within cults, you're not told ahead of time what you're really signing up for and what kind of sacrifices you're going to be expected to make and what your life is really going to look like when you get involved um, and all the people you're going to need to say goodbye to also when you get involved. Um, and I think the other part that really is key for me too is that the rules that apply to the leader um, are very small and usually those are ones that the leader will decide apply to him or her. All the other rules only apply to the followers. So the leader can live in any way he or she chooses and can um, live in a mansion when the followers are sleeping on the floor and can have many sexual partners when the followers need to be celibate. I'm using these examples from things that I know. Um, and can also eat certain foods, dress certain ways, don't have to answer to anyone, really. Um, but the followers have to answer to the leaders at every turn. Um, the other part, though, is that there is this feeling along the way that you really are never going to be done with this. That when you get involved in some sort of educational program or even join a church, you can go if you want to, if it's not feeding your soul, if it's not answering your questions, if it's not the program you thought it was going to be. But with a cult, you're never done. You're never 
ever done. That's and so true. That's such a good point. Uh, yeah, I can certainly relate to that in Scientology because even though they have a bridge to total freedom that has, you know, a, a top to it, you know, they have this chart with all these services, all these levels that you go through. When you get to the top, they are not done with you. Right. Because there's right. always something else that you could be yeah. doing in Scientology. There's always, always some something. class you haven't done, always some service you haven't taken part in, or like Scientology is doing now, they put you on a hamster wheel where they put you back at the beginning practically and you have to redo things over mm -hmm. and over again. And you're like, why is this happening? And of course, that's that that what you just talked about is why it's happening is because there is no end. The, the, the point of it is not to shoot you out the top, it's to keep you on a hamster wheel. Right, exactly right. When you're involved in a cult, you don't make forward movement. You only make lateral movement, you only go in reverse, or you go in a circle. Um, there's something very regressive about it for some people. Um, parents will tell me, and I've seen it myself with kids who are not kids anymore, when they get involved in a cult, they start acting very much like they're teenagers again. They don't want to talk about it, and you don't understand, and you know, getting kind of petulant about it. And there's some something in the nature of cults that does that. Um, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't, <laughs> I don't understand that at all. <laughs> right. Sorry. I know. I I yeah. I could be totally wrong. Yeah, um, I, I cannot relate to that in any way. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but it is also true that the lateral moves happen a lot, where you take a class and you thought you were going to go one direction in your life and then they say ah in order to get there you need to do this and then you have to do that again and then you have to keep going that way or then when you're done you go that way and take another class and recruit more members or bring in more money for us keep our machine well oiled while you're forfeiting all of your dreams all of what really you had in mind for your life um, and that's a very difficult thing um, when people get involved in cults because they think they are under this illusion that their life is better than it's ever been and it has this forward momentum that it wouldn't have otherwise. It's actually quite the opposite. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point on that. I'd like to know you know, we call them destructive cults for a reason, right? I mean, we, we, we feel, I mean, me as a cult survivor and, you know, and you as a cult therapist, I mean, we use these words advisedly. They don't just, I don't just throw out the word destructive just just because. Mm -hmm. What has been, what have been some of the more destructive or damaging effects you've seen in, in your years of counseling uh, from people's participation in these cults? Okay, so uh, first of all, cults will rampantly cause um, human rights violations um, and to a great degree get away with it, which is the maddening part. Um, there is abuse of all sorts, emotional abuse, neglect, child abuse, uh, all of it. Um, and so that's always going to be certainly destructive. Um, what's also very destructive is how much a cult can temporarily, while you're in it, make you handicapped. You're not able to act on your own behalf. You're not able to see things the way they really are so that you can gather the information you need so that you can make an educated decision that if this is safe for you, if it's not safe for you, if it's helping, if it's not, if it's destroying you to a certain degree, or if it's healing you at all. Um, and so you're kept from being able to access that part of you that can guide you. In fact, you're told not to trust it. If you have any feelings about the cult that are at all negative, there's something wrong with you that uh, depends on the group, that's the devil, or that's being closed-minded, or that's moving away from the light, or that's your reactive mind, or, you know. Yeah, I've never heard that one. Yeah. 
<laughs> right. I know, Chris, I'm glad we're talking. I'm sure I'm teaching you a lot of uh, new terms. Oh, yeah. I never experienced any of this. No, yeah. no right. Um, no, that's, it's, it, 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 the, the reactive mind is the scapegoat in Scientology mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. any right. negative thoughts, you know, any negative, anything that ever happens to you, or doubts or reservations that you have about what's happening or what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It always comes back to, yeah, no, that's just your reactive mind doing that, dude. And exactly. you just get over that. You know, you need to be stronger than that. You need to overcome that. Yeah. Right, exactly. And why? I mean, that's the interesting part. The part that doesn't get answered in a cult is why? Why is that important for you to get over it? I mean, it's answered, but it's not answered honestly. The reason that you have to get over your reactive mind is that usually cults are run by sociopaths, run by narcissists, and they can't handle you questioning any of it. And they can't handle any negative reaction. They don't want dissension. They don't want questioning. They don't want to be um, taken to task for anything. So if they can demonize that part of you that you have that you have as part of your kind of system of protection in your mind, so that you can assess situations and act on them, um, if they can handicap you keep you from accessing it, make you feel there's something wrong with you for reacting that way, then they never have to admit, the cult leader, I mean, never has to admit that the reason he or she doesn't want you to have those feelings is because he can't handle it. And that's really it. There's nothing wrong with it. In fact, that's your safety net. Yeah, precisely. People should always have a uh freedom to think and feel and say whatever they want mm -hmm. right exactly yeah. and exactly right and within a cult there's so many secrets and part of what it can be so destructive to go back to another example of why i consider these groups to be destructive is that there's this code of secrecy that you're not supposed to share um the you know, secret beliefs and teachings, you're not supposed to disclose what happens in the group. And the only way really they get you to follow that is by instilling some fear in you that something bad will happen to you if you disclose it. Or something bad, uh, this happened to actually once or twice with new clients, that they were told that not only would something bad happen to them if they told this sort of sharing the secrets and they told the stories, but something bad would happen to the person they told it to. And they actually at times needed for me to call them after I got home after the session or after I got home uh, after a long day of work to let them know that I was not hit by a bus and I wasn't abducted and whatever else they were told was going to happen to the person they told it to. Um, and now and I have to ask about that is fascinating. And that happens with other destructive cults than just Scientology. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> cause it's, cause it's rather infamous, you know, with Scientology, the OT3, Xenu story and how that's supposed to literally kill you. Yeah. You find out that information, right? Yeah. And of course, you know, by record uh, and statistics, we have a, you know, 0% people dying finding <laughs> out about Xenu, right? right? Like so far, nobody, yeah. no deaths reported yet from Xenu. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the mystique in Scientology, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was, but it's fascinating because that's the only place I've, you know, personally been familiar with that kind of a consequence of, of sharing the secrets is, you know, that that's in Scientology. I'm, that's they say that or they threaten that. But there are other destructive cults that do that, too. Yeah. Well, abusers and controllers survive uh, by keeping people quiet. Think about how many uh, children who tell that, you know, when they've been molested, they talk about being told, this is just gonna be our secret. Um, and it's something that also people, I mean, cult leaders of all kinds, 
are going to be able to utilize to keep the secret, um, especially if they introduce that notion of secrecy laced with fear. A fear-based teaching um, is something that gets under your skin, especially if it's invisible. Like this might happen or this could happen or um, the devil could be there or you might have this bad thing happen to you. You can't prove it or disprove it, but it still gets under your skin. It's like um, superstition. I am not a superstitious person, but I do think twice before I walk under a ladder. I have right. to admit. Right. Exactly. Because right? exactly. you say, hmm, I don't know. Let me just not take this risk, even though I think superstitions are ridiculous. Right. Okay. Right. But it could, it could happen. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And you just feel kind of uncomfortable and why risk it? And, and so, so that is part of human nature that we are usually controlled much more so by the kind of teachings that come along with fear-based kind of, um, I guess, warnings and predictions. Um, and so people don't want to take a risk. And then cult leaders keep getting away with it to a great degree. For sure. I think that's, um, I think breaking free of that, those mental, those psychological traps that get laid, I, th I you know, they're kind of like little landmines that get laid in your head when you get involved in these groups. And I think for me and probably for other people that um, the one reason why it's so cathartic to speak out is because you're kind of blowing up those minds when you're doing that. You know, you exactly. kind of let them, let them go. And then, exactly. you know, and then, and you're like finding out that, oh, I'm not dead. Nobody else is dead. I'm still going. And in fact, my life is even better now as a result of having let go of and spoken out about those fears and those doubts and those worries and, and, and threats and various things. Because I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think there's more to that fear-based control than maybe a lot of people might realize uh, when they're in those situations. Yeah, and you see it also in the way the this idea of Mm, we are the only true fill in the blank and you'll never be able to find another group like this and you'll never get the answers and you'll never be happy. And in the kind of controlling one-on-one -on -one relationships, um, you should feel specially chosen by me and you'd never find anyone else to love you in the same way because you're not really lovable to anyone else. All of that is also behavior conditioning and modification and it keeps you there and it keeps you from having those moments where you feel free to make a decision, where you feel free to, to leave, because you can start to believe that there really aren't any other ways to be happy, have a relationship with God, whatever the teachings are of the group. Um, just like, you know, any kind of technique of influence. Uh, think about the Home Shopping Network, right? This is the only place where you can get such and such. And if you call before midnight, right, it's time dated, you have to sign up now, right? Just like in a cult, you have to sign up now. You yeah, can't that's, that's, the buy now. that's right. The buy now. Have to buy it now. Have to buy it now. This is your last opportunity. If you don't take advantage of it now, you know, think about the risks that you're taking that you're never going to have this opportunity again. Um, uh, cults don't let you sort of take a form with all their information and say, go home and do your research. Uh, and think about, you know, if you want to get involved or not. Add, talk to some former members. And <laughs> no, they, they, the words you'll never hear. Go home and think about this. You know, take your time. And get back to right. us when you're ready. Right. Exactly. <laughs> no. Exactly. I mean, uh, there are salespeople, used car salespeople, who will say, you know what? I'd love to be able to sign you up now for this new car or this used car. Like, you know, think about it. Think about it. You mean, salespeople let you have a moment where you can sort of take your time, do your research, and that's a much more respectful way of operating. But with cults, you have to make a decision on the spot. Um, right. And if you don't, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. Very much so. And I think that also speaks something to the way that cults will get people in in the first place and then of course keep them in as they set up a pattern of 
of getting a person used to um, an appeal to emotion. Mm -hmm. right? Where you're driving the person forward by what feels good or what feels right, rather than actually rationally thinking through what it is that you're doing. And exactly. it's all about the, you know, getting it in the heat of the moment and the, and the, and the you know, the good feeling and the, you know, this is going to be so great, you know, and this kind of thing. And mm -hmm. now's the time to do it. You have to act now. And of course, you know, any doubts or reservations you're having, that's just your reactive mind telling you that. Right. You know, that's, that's just right. a bank. It's another word yeah. for science, Scientology, right? The reactive mind is the, is the reactive bank. Mm -hmm. And so they just call it the bank. And now oh, that's the bank talking. You know, that's, don't be listening to your bank now. And they could just as easily be saying, don't be listening to the Smurfs, you know? <laughs> like, it's just as ridiculous because it's just yeah. as imaginary. But they sell you on this idea that this thing that you can't see, can't prove, somehow exists and is having this effect on you. Okay, so I'd like to cover the kinds of people who come to see you, um, you know, like, Obviously, you have cult survivors. You have people who have come out of cults and whatnot. But like, what is it that um, that draws them to you for counseling? And how long do they usually take to get to you? And is that too long? Like, or is it you know what would be in your experience now an ideal amount of time before somebody should be seeking some counseling or some help? I am a licensed therapist, so I meet with a whole variety of people about a whole variety of issues. Uh, and a large percentage of my practice is former cult members and also the families and friends of people who are involved in cults and want to know what to do. Um, for former cult members, you know, sometimes they contact me uh, because they know I know something about it and they don't want to have the experience that either they've had before or they know other people have had, which is that they've gone to see a therapist who didn't know about cults or didn't believe in them or didn't think mind control is an actual thing. And they have had to, on their own time and their own dime, educate the therapist so the therapist could potentially help them. And sometimes that goes well, some, usually it doesn't. Um, and so they know that they can come in and talk about their experience and I'm not gonna you know, look at them askew and wonder what they're talking about and if they're being delusional. I can tell also if someone's coming to me and they believe that something is true and that they've been through an experience or they've been abducted by UFOs and I know not to see them and to refer them elsewhere. Um, but I've heard enough of these stories where I know what can happen and what people can come to believe in actual cults. Um, and they like not having to educate me and having to prove that they were really being controlled um, and that they really went through something that transformed their mind for a period of time. Um, I think also knowing that because I'm a therapist, I can talk about other issues too, that sometimes former cult members, yeah, they wanna talk about their experience, but they also need to talk about their relationship with their family or their relationship with their spouse or how to raise their child now that they're out in the world and they're not being guided by the cult leader, usually poorly, um, for how to raise their child. Um, and so I'm open to talking about whatever they want to talk about. There are also a lot of issues around sexuality that people are confused about when they come out of especially Bible-based cults. Um, and so we can talk about those issues too. So when is it too soon. I think there isn't a too soon. Um, and no, that's good to know. yeah, there is. There isn't a too soon, and there isn't a too late. But really, it's soon. The sooner, the better. Um, and the reason I say that is that sometimes when people have gone a long time after leaving a cult, and they're fine, then they're fine. Then they're they were able to kind of. Mm, kind of be in the cult sort of with one foot in and one foot out, and so it wasn't so hard to leave. But for a lot of people, they leave not really feeling either that they um, uh, have the right to feel better or that they're deserving to feel better because they left or they were kicked out and they were made to feel that they had failed the group in some way 
or they had failed the world in some way um, by not being able to stay in the group and follow along with this sort of lofty goal that the group had to transform the world. So they go and leave and stay in this mode of kind of suffering and feeling like they're supposed to suffer. Other people leave and find that they have a lot of trouble with relationships, um, with employment, getting along with a boss, someone who's telling you what to do. Um, it's going to be fraught with issues. Um, uh, I think what, what I've noticed is that when people come right away and they say they're out, they're from what I can see, if it's sort of within the first month or so, they're out mostly. They're right. Still There's still so much acclimating and things to get their right. head on straight about. Exactly right. And, and some of them have left, but they haven't told people yet that they've left, or they haven't told their families, or they're afraid to tell their family who's out because they're afraid that the family is gonna throw a party for them. They're not ready to have a party. They are confused and they're depressed and they have a sense of loss and they don't know what they're doing. And also some people who are out for a period of time and don't get counseling end up going what I call cult shopping. They, they sort of look for the next group, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly, precisely the wrong thing to be doing. Right. Well, you know, when you're in an organization that that gives you the formula to follow, there's something for some people that's very uh, relieving, relaxing, comforting about that. And so suddenly being out, not having a formula, you feel like, you know, all hell is going to break loose. So you look for the next person who is dictatorial and who will tell you, you have to do this in order to have this. And that is a very appealing message because you haven't learned that that's actually a dangerous group to be in and that you don't actually need that. Um, so sometimes people have, they come to see me, but they haven't actually formally left their group and they don't know if they should say something to the leader, if they should, come up with some sort of reason that would satisfy the leader about why they've left and that's that's never going to happen. So I tell them to use their their uh, energy in other ways. Um, but I think one of the things that is so important is that I see as my role with these clients is to help them understand what a cult is and what the techniques of control are that they went through. And I just list the techniques of influence and control and have them come up with examples from their own group. Ah, yes, that happened to me and this is how it happened. And this is what it looked like in my group. So they understand that they got involved in something that is really a science. And it, then it doesn't mean that they were stupid and it doesn't mean that they were gullible and it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. It means that they got caught up because of human nature dictates that we can sometimes get caught up in things like this if it is offered to us in a way that speaks to us or offered to us at a time in our lives where it speaks to us. And so they can learn that, that there wasn't there wasn't something wrong with them that they believed it, that this was something that really is a science. And uh, take the techniques are something that um, cult leaders have become experts at doing and, and um, putting their members through. The other part is helping the clients who see me um, to pace themselves to not have to share everything right away, to not flood me with information because they feel like that's what they're supposed to do with someone who's in a position of authority, to take their time, not because it's so easy then to feel overwhelmed. Oh my God, I just said all of this to this other person. She's now gonna think I'm crazy or she's gonna think something bad or I, I, I can't go back. A lot of them feel kind of shameful that they share too much. So I'll sometimes ask people to slow down and I also re, 
it's like I remind them of the pace that is typical and expected that is a social norm within society outside. Um, and I do a lot of kind of re-educating in that way about this is how it is, this is how people usually operate with each other. But the other thing that I do that, um, that I learned to do over time is that I encourage a client to ask me questions about me. I encourage a new client to interview me to assess if they want to see me. I'm in a position of authority, but I'm not a cult leader. So you can question me. I don't mind. You're not going to get punished. And I encourage them to disagree. I am not going to know everything. I don't want to know everything. I don't want to be right all the time. I don't need to be right all the time. And I want you as a person out of the cult to realize that you get to be right as much as I get to be right. And if I say something that doesn't seem quite right for you or if I'm making a guess and I'm off, tell me and experience what that's like outside of a cult that I'm not going to banish you and I'm not going to punish you and God's not going to punish you and I'm not going to use all these other ways to punish you. Um, and I'll value the fact that you felt safe enough to share how you really felt. Um, so it's about helping the people really practice those skills so that they can then learn again how to take care of themselves in the world and speak up for themselves and, you know, learn the art of that kind of conversation. Um, it's an interesting process, certainly. It really is. But the other part is about sharing things that you've been told are secret. Um, convincing people that they don't have to worry and that they can share things that are secret. It's, that's a hard sell, must say. It really is. Um, but I think, and this is something that helps some of my clients, when I tell them that once people knowingly harm you, they, and they knowingly harm you and manipulate you for their gain, they, they lose the right to have you keep their secrets. Very good point. Um, and then also reminding people what their rights are, just in general. Mm -hmm. um, that they have the right to disagree, they have the right to come and go as they please. Um, if they need to leave early from the session, or if they arrive late because of traffic, it's LA, right? <laughs> Everyone's late because of traffic. Um, that's okay. That's okay. And you're not going to be called on the carpet, and you're not going to be publicly shamed, and I'm not going to decide something is awful about you you know just having them experiences but the other part is getting the other people in their world involved in helping them so that they don't have to do this alone um i ask people as soon as they feel ready who would they also like to have be part of this therapy in the office or just by virtue of who's out there who they can talk to who they can connect with in a way where they don't have to feel isolated. Um, and then as much as I can, I try to help them get connected to other former members who get it, especially other former members of the same group. Makes sense. Yeah. So what, um, so what, when people will come to you for information or for advice or something, where, um, like, what other resources do they have out there that they can go to when they're looking for, like, free information or advice or referrals or what should they do exactly or, you know, what are destructive cults and that sort of thing? Like, where, what, what do they do? Right. So, now that you're out of a cult, you actually, um, you have the bonus of being able to study your cult and get information about it that you were not able to access when you were in it. Um, so how nice. Um, it's really a symbol of your freedom. And, um, and so being able to contact an organization like the, the ICSA, the International Cultic Studies Association, uh, it's a wonderful organization that has great information about a lot of different groups and about mind control, 
in particular. Um, also, Freedom of Mind, Steve Hassan's organization, a wonderful organization as well. Uh, and there are people out there in our field who have been incredibly useful to help families offer them information, do interventions, uh, and the ICSA and Freedom of Mind and groups like it can refer you to people who if you're looking for someone to do an intervention, um, someone else you want to see if you can help get out of the cult, or another family member who's still stuck in it, and you want to see if you can save them. Um, there's also a treatment center in Ohio called Wellspring, which is for former cult members. And, um, and it's an incredible resource. Uh, and it offers you a chance to go and be away and not have to worry about being kind of hounded by the people in your cult, which is what a lot of people have to deal with when they leave, that they're getting calls night and day asking wh where they are, when they're coming back, or people are patrolling out in front of their house or whatever is happening. And they can just go away and enjoy being in a retreat that is wonderfully healthy and you can leave at any time um, and you get to really learn about what you went through and what a cult is and it's an intensive kind of therapy that you can, I believe you can go there for one week or two weeks, but it'd be best to contact them to find out for sure. There are very few resources, uh, unfortunately, I think because of funding. Um, but that's why it's important to know what is out there. So I'm happy that you're giving your viewers a chance to find out. That's really yeah, wonderful. Sure. I, I definitely want them to to know what the resources are out there. And of course, I'm learning about some of this myself as we go here. When would be the right time or situation for somebody to contact you directly? People can contact me at any time when they're ready to start counseling, to be able to come in and make a commitment to the work. They can come and set up sessions with me in-house, in my office. There are people who will, um, will contract with me to do consultations and sessions who are out of state, sometimes even um, internationally I get calls, I do Skype sessions, um, and, uh, and then we just set up a fee and we set up when to talk and deal with, you know, time changes and all of that. Um, but I think it's important for people when they need information and resources and referrals to contact the organizations that are set up to do so and to contact me for counseling and to contact me for the help that they need because they're finding emotionally that they're needing to get over their experience and they really want to seek professional help. That totally makes sense. Uh, just is there an average or is there any sort of like idea of um, you know, how often or how long such counseling would take place? I, mean, I, I, know, I know it's a hard question because it's so individual from person to person. Right, it is very individual from person to person and um, everyone operates on their own sort of uh, time frame where it has to do, I think, with a couple of things. One is um, how long you were involved in the group and if you are a second or now even third generation, if this is the only life you've ever known, that's going to take some time. It's not an impossible task to get beyond it, but it is going to take some time, a little more time than someone who got involved uh, later on in their lives. Um, also, it has to do with your psychological strength. Some people just know about themselves that they feel a little more fragile and so they are going to need a little bit more time just to get past the experience because because the therapy needs to go a little slowly so that they're not overwhelmed by it. Um, and that's something that I would work with the client on so we find the pacing that works best for them. 
Um, and I think for other people too, um, they sometimes need more because of the experiences that they've had within it. If it's been horribly abusive, um, then there's a lot of post-traumatic stress that we're dealing with on top of everything else. Um, and also if people don't have, um, they don't have a community around them, if they're isolated, they'll sometimes need more help from me just because every day is a difficult day because they're alone. Um, that's why I love to have as, as part of my work, helping people realize that they have a community outside of the group. And even if they didn't realize it and if their families aren't there for whatever reason, um, or their friends have left them because they, you know, they feel like they've burned bridges with their friends, there's a community of former members that they can connect with as well. And they, I think that I want to make sure that people have a community also before I say goodbye um, and leave them just out on their own. But I think in terms of a time frame, I've noticed that it's especially important uh, for people when they're going for counseling from any experience that was life altering for a stretch of time to go through a passage of a year because within that year at least and again it doesn't have to be a year i'm not saying you, you know you're not going to get help unless you stay for a year but i've noticed that there are these kind of anniversaries that come up throughout that first year same thing if you deal with a loss you know the first thanksgiving without that person in your family who was there last year right there are those moments that are going to trigger those, wow, you know, last time I celebrated this, I was with all these other people who now don't talk to me anymore. Um, or I couldn't celebrate my birthday because I was in a group that didn't celebrate birthdays, and now I get to celebrate it for the first time, and wow. Um, and so to go through all of those firsts seems to be kind of an important thing to do, and having a therapist sort of you know, in your corner so that you can go through those moments and have them be not as painful, not as difficult for that first year specifically. Totally makes sense. Yeah, and, some, and you know, and people have been involved with these things for years, some people even decades, so to expect that you're going to snap out of it in a week or two or a month or even six months is, it is ridiculously unrealistic. Uh, right. And so when people ask me for a time frame, I say, you know, we can come up with a time frame, but it's going to be a bit arbitrary. And it's also not going to be fully up to me. That's the other part. That's the non-cult part, right? I don't get to decide right. when you're better. Yeah, you and don't I have a whole other bridge to total freedom you're putting them on. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, exactly. I, I misspoke during our first session seven months ago, so that means we have to start at the beginning and read the question. Is that a problem? It, it, you know, it's actually not funny. I should not be laughing at that, but yeah, exactly. But that's exactly. what happened. It's like, you're kidding me. We have to do this all again. Um, but the other part is that sometimes people will feel that they're done, and I want people to get to the point where they... I mean, it's not good for me financially, but I like when people feel like they've had enough and they want to go try things on their own. If I were fraudulent, I'd say, no, you still need to come and see me, I can tell. Um, right. but, um, but what happens is sometimes people feel fine and then something triggers them. Um, and they realize, wow, that's still something that they have to get some help with. That went right through them. Uh, and sometimes it's when people um, have children out of the group and they were raised in a group and they suddenly realize how they were mistreated because there's nothing in them that would allow them to treat their own child the way they were treated in the group. That can be a huge trigger. Um, and how could that have happened and how could their parents have let that happen, et cetera. Um, and so you never know what it's gonna be, but every once in a while you do get triggered and, you know, I tell people, you know, go and good luck and enjoy and keep reading if you want and get help and talk to other former members. And if something triggers you, you know where to find me. Excellent. 
Okay, good. Well, I think uh, I think we've covered a lot of territory here, and I think we've uh, we you know we've certainly got a lot more to cover, and we're going to do that on a separate occasion because um, I've got about ten more questions I want to ask you that I know we're going to open the floodgates to a whole other round of information in terms of family activity. What what should families do to get family members out of a destructive cult or friends? Um, second generation, third generation cult members, what, what that whole thing is about and the psychology of that and that sort of thing, I'd very much like to go over and, um, and you know, some more about the recovery process itself. So we've, we've got lots to cover in the future, uh, but I think we've covered some really good ground here. So thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Bye, folks. <laughs>